Now, I've got an interesting question for you. Is it possible in this modern day and age, that's 2021 in the case of recording of this video, is it possible to actually buy a brand new 8-bit computer? Let's find out. Wi-Fi Sheep would like to say a huge thank you to all of you that kindly support us. Help us continue to bring new videos like this. Join patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep from just $1 a month. So, yeah, I don't think we're going to get an absolutely definitive answer with this subject, but it's a very interesting one to investigate. Before we continue, I'd like to tell you about the turnkey PCB assembly services provided by our partners at PCBGoGo.com. These include PCB manufacturing and assembly, component sourcing, functional testing and IC programming. PCB GoGo manufacturing bases are equipped with the most advanced production equipment, such as Yamaha pick and place machines, reflow oven, wave soldering machines, X-ray and AOI testing machines, all operated by highly skilled technical personnel. PCB GoGo is the leading specialist in surface mount through hole and mixed technology PCB assembly and electronic manufacturing services, as well as turnkey electronic PCB assembly. PCB GoGo provides easy and cost-effective online ordering services from prototype to mass production. So join today. Sign up for your free account today at PCBGoGo.com. Details and links are in the description. Okay, so first of all, I think we actually need to have a look at what we actually mean when we say 8-bit. So to help understand and illustrate a little bit better what exactly 8-bit is and means, uh, we'll come back to this rig, which I built ooh, about two years ago now here on the channel. Uh, so those of you that are regulars or subscribers to Wi-Fi Sheet will probably recognize this rig. This is my 6502 microprocessor rig, and I've taken the stock vintage chip from a 8-bit Acorn BBC Micro, in this case, it's a SY, which stands for Cinetech or Sinatech 6502A. And it's a official clone version of the MOS or MOS Technologies 6502, the famous microprocessor from the kind of early 1970s that powered things like Atari, Apple, a variation powered Commodore. And it was also found in the Nintendo Entertainment System slash Famicom. So this chip has got a real heritage and it's a true 8-bit microprocessor. Before I turn it on, I'll physically show you the part of this processor that makes it 8-bit. So on a chip you've got lots of pins or legs and on this setup I attached multiple lines here to these LEDs. From this pin here all the way around to roughly about here is what we call the address bus. Now on a 6502 that's a 16-bit address bus with each of these legs representing one bit of data. Now, what makes this chip 8-bit is actually these pins here. And I'm just going to unhook and move this wire out of the way. This wire is the reset line. So we'll just hook and move. There we go. So, what I've got here are eight resistors. And I've got power rails, so the top rail here is 5 volts, and the bottom rail is negative or ground. And from this pin here, all the way through to here, are 8 pins. And these 8 pins represent a bit, and there is the physical 8 bits that make up an 8-bit microprocessor. Now we count from here, which is D0, or data line 0, all the way through to data line 7. So you don't count 1 to 8, it's 0 to 7. And in order to make this chip work, I've had to manually and mechanically wire in an instruction. So if a resistor is hooked up here, that means a 1. So it's 5 volts is 1. And if it's hooked like this one to ground, that's a 0. So we can actually count the binary of the instruction for the microprocessor. So in this case, I've put in 1, one one zero one zero one zero and that instruction from binary if converted into hexadecimal would equal instruction to do nothing 
So when people refer to 8-bit, this is physically, mechanically, what 8-bit actually looks like. Now, it's been a little while since I've actually powered this up. So first of all, let's just put our reset line back on. I've got a Raspberry Pi power transformer plugged in to a micro USB adapter and then two wires, positive and negative, which are looped here to the breadboard. So if we plug in on the mains, you can now see that, well, I say you see, what always happens is the LEDs on this always trip the focus out, unfortunately. There we go. So you can now see the instruction to do nothing is making the microprocessor count and we can actually watch binary being counted. So that's what an 8-bit processor actually is and what it's meant to be, but can you actually buy a new product that has an 8-bit microprocessor in it? And you might say, well, of course you can. You can pop on eBay and you can buy yourself used hardware. So I've got myself a Sinclair ZX Spectrum right here, um, but this is used. It's not new. It's not a new production unit. You might say, well, there has been some new 8-bit computers. What about the... Nintendo NES Classic Edition or the NES Mini or the more recent C64. Well, I've got a bit of bad news for you. They're not actually proper 8-bit computers. They may look like 8-bit computers and they do run 8-bit software, but they're actually 32-bit. Both those particular products use the all-winner ARM CPU architecture. Uh, you can find identical chips on a lot of the cheap clone Raspberry Pi boards, such as the Orange Pi, in this case, using a H2 variant of the All Winner ARM chip. And these are 32 bit multi core processors. Sticking with our uh, ZX Spectrum or ZX Spectrum theme, what about the ZX Spectrum Next? Again, interesting and brand new computer system, but it's FPGA based, which is Field Programmable Gate Array. This is a type of microprocessor that can effectively shapeshift by loading a core. So instead of being a software emulator, it's kind of like a hardware emulator. The processor will physically switch on and off gates within itself in order to reconfigure itself into being a 8-bit or 16-bit microprocessor. If you could call that actual 8-bit, this is where I have a slight problem because it's not strictly speaking an 8-bit microprocessor, but it's nearer a real processor than let's say the NES Classic Edition or the C64 use, which is just software emulation. Of course, it is actually possible to buy a brand new 8-bit kit computer, and there's a couple of products out on the market at the moment. So a good example would be the Mini Pet that's come out recently, and this uses a Western Design Center 6502. You can still buy brand new versions of the 6502 microprocessor. We've also seen a kit product, which I forget the name of, based around the Xilog Z80 or Z80 microprocessor. The slight issue with these computers, be it kit or ready built, is they're all quite expensive. And that can be rather off-putting, especially if you have limited time, money or resources. What if you have a very limited budget, but actually want to buy a genuine real 8-bit microcomputer? Well, you're in luck, because I have, in this little envelope, a real 8-bit computer that you can buy for as little as three or four British pounds, which is about eight or nine US dollars. Let's check it out. Okay, so let's have a close look what's in the envelope, and in here should be a modern day, 21st century, 8-bit computer. And that's a 8-bit as in not something trying to recreate or pretend to be its 1980s ancestor. And there we go. And that's right, you've probably already seen these on the channel before. It's actually a Arduino Nano, or a clone Arduino Nano. These are proper 8-bit computers that are manufactured in the modern day. This is what a modern era 8-bit actually looks like. So let's uh, see if we can get into this. Let's go and grab a knife. There we go. A 
there we are. So you've no doubt seen these sort of boards before. These are clones of the Arduino board. Uh, they're not officially Arduino products. Now, if they're clones, that's fine. What annoys me is when they try to pass themselves off as proper Arduinos, which these are. So it, that's when they become fakes. But these are just clearly clones. Uh, very similar to the sort of uh, nano board we've used here on the channel before. And here in the centre, you have the Atmega 328P, which is a modern 8-bit microprocessor. This isn't just the chip, it's not like the 6502 you saw previous. This also has 2K of RAM, that's 2 kilobytes of RAM, 1K EEPROM for storage, a, a flash storage device for holding the ROM for the actual program or content you'd upload. It also has a general input output, so you have a USB, or in this case, a mini USB for power and also for data, and you can also transfer data from the analog and the digital pins. So the A's and D's on here don't refer to data and address. They actually refer to analog and digital and they can both be an input and an output pin. So these things are absolutely fantastic. They also have serial, TX and RX serial. Uh, really, really versatile little reset button on the top. Um, this is truly what an 8-bit computer looks like in the 2020s. Now you might have noticed that my particular board comes as a bit of a kit so it has some headers that we can put on. Now you don't actually have to put any of the headers on. In fact let's just power this little board off just to make sure it works. So for this I've got an iPhone, Apple iPhone charger, a USB one so it's British standard uh, 240 volts mains and there's a standard USB that goes in there and that's 5 volts out so we'll plug that into the mains. And the other end I have here is a mini USB, so this will just plug straight in. Now if we just hold the sides of the board carefully, let's put the power on and it should, at the very least, light up. And it does. And you'll notice here it's actually now blinking. So most Arduino 8-bit computers, when they are booted for the first time, they actually have a preloaded program, which is simply called Blink, and it just blinks the loading LED on and off, so we've got power, and it is actually executing its program. We can reset, and there you go, it runs the program again. So we know this is working. So now we can look at if we're going to attach anything to the pins or not. Now, you don't have to attach anything to the pins if you're quite happy with the way it is, but it does mean this microcontroller can't be fitted into other circuits or devices. Now, it comes with some pre-cut headers for soldering and you could attach them like that or as I'm going to do we're actually going to attach them to the bottom and that will effectively create a plug-in chip that we can use in breadboards. If we wanted to run this as a standalone board and we wanted to easily plug some jumpers in you can get reverse jumpers which instead of being pins are actually plugs and you can buy these in strips like this we could cut for example and we could actually fit in like that. Then in that scenario, if we had some jumper wire, we could then plug in and plug and play like so. Uh, I'm not gonna do that for this particular board. I'm gonna set it up in a more standard manner, but it's something to think about which you could do. Now, soldering, whenever I talk about soldering on this channel, I always, always get people telling me I'm doing it wrong or I'm not doing it right or blah, 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 blah all the time. All I will say, yet again, is this is how I solder. If you solder differently, that's fantastic. You go for it. This is the method that I find very easy and it kind of works for me. So for making soldering up the parts easier, I've got a new fresh clean breadboard and I'm actually going to set up the parts in the board because the problem is trying to solder these in. It's very easy to get the parts not in straight and they rock and it can be awkward. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the pins in like that. Now we should be able to slot our board into our preset headers. 
There is this additional little header which should sit in here, which I'm not going to put on this board because I don't need to use it. So this is all I want to use. Now I use some flux to help clean and make a cleaner join with the uh, alloy that we're going to heat up to use as a solder. So for this I use Topnik RF800 which is an alcohol based flux that will evaporate but it is extremely potent so you need to do this in a very well ventilated space. And it's just a screw cap with a brush on the end and we can be quite liberal in just brushing on and it will all evaporate off, so don't worry about that. And I got some pewter single core solder. And my soldering iron over here has just been heating up. So just give that another moment and I think we're ready to go. Okay, so I think we're ready to have a go at soldering now. This is always rather tricky to do behind the camera. And I always go back over the joints off camera just to make sure that I've got everything right. But it's actually really, really simple to do. It's always surprised me when people, you know, they're very fearful of soldering, which I understand. And I don't proclaim for a second to be an expert, but it's not tricky to do. Uh, unless, of course, you're quite a way away from your work looking at it through a viewfinder of a camera. Then it can be quite tricky. So you will do a lot better job than what I'm doing. And you can already see here I need to go back over some of these joints. So that one's got too much on and this one I've missed altogether. So it's not a big problem. There we go. Just make sure we've reflowed properly. That's actually looking much better. So we'll just make sure we... There we go. Again, you have to understand I'm not seeing this at the angle that you're seeing it. And uh, it's not looking too bad that I said one or two of these I'm going to sort of cut off camera we'll just go back over again like A1 looking a little bit suspect there we go but that's actually not looking too bad at all I've just finished doing the soldering and off camera I've just touched that back up just to make sure that it was actually making a good connection and I'm actually really really happy with that so just to make sure we haven't toasted it by soldering, which I think is probably unlikely, but let's just test. We'll put some power back on. And you can see there, it's perfectly happy and still working fine. Now, a lot of home 8-bit microcomputers of the era, so think Sinclair Spectrum, Commodore 64, BBC Micro, whatever, when you actually turn them on, they booted instantly and they actually booted to the basic computer programming language. So can we make our little Arduino 8-bit machine do virtually the same thing? So if we're going to make our 8-bit device do anything. The first thing we need to do is plug it into another computer. So in this case, I'm going to be using a Windows 7 laptop. So I'm going to just unplug, as I have done, unplug the power supply from the USB and then we'll plug the USB straight into the computer window should detect it and you'll notice the minute the board's got power it starts blinking again it's running its blinking program which comes pre-installed so if we come over to Windows if we're using clone Arduino boards we need to install a driver and I have one of the latest drivers here it's the CH Free, you're normally called 340 or 341 and you can find this download by googling online and we can just run the setup and we'll say yes and I've already installed it but you click to install the driver on the system if you don't install the drivers for Windows or Mac using clone Arduinos the Arduinos won't read properly with uh, the IDE environments Linux users are unaffected. You don't have to install any third-party drivers to use proper Arduinos or cloned Arduinos with your system. Okay, so next we need the Arduino IDE. And any new sketch will actually load with just a blank space here. So we need to now make sure we've set the board up. So if it's only Arduino on, it should detect it on COM port 6. We want to select the board is Arduino Nano and this is something I've had an issue with this particular 
uh, board I'm using. So normally you'd select for bootloader, you'd select the Atmega 328P. Now if we click to upload, I'll show you what happens. So it compiles the sketch. All this is going to do is wipe the program and put literally a blank program on. So it's compiled it, now it's going to attempt to upload it. So as you can see it actually gets stuck and it generates an error. It says attempt 10 out of 10, not in sync, problems uploading to the board. If you get this kind of error, what you need to do is go into tools and select the old bootloader. Now if we attempt to upload again, you can see it now says done uploading and you'll notice that the flashing has now stopped on the Arduino itself because we've now actually added the new blank program. So that's brilliant. So we know this now works and we can now upload code. What I have here is a stock version of Tiny Basic Plus in an Arduino sketch format. That's what the .ino format is. And um, again, we'll double click to open this in the Arduino IDE environment. And this is a completely open source basic interpreter written in the C variant that the Arduino uses. So it's actually really cool just to go through the code. And you can see here, here's all the um, tokens or the keywords used for each of the basic commands. So all this is, you know, really, really cool to look at and does mean you can make modifications, which is something we have actually been doing for uh, tiny basic computers if you've been following that project on the channel. Now, this should be able to upload an entire basic interpreter onto our new nano board. So let's see if it works. And we won't worry about those two downloading errors because that's nothing to do with um, the actual uh, upload. And it says upload, it says done uploading. So that I think was actually successful. So what we can do now is we can see if it actually worked by where are we? Let's go to tools and serial monitor. Making sure that you actually set yourself to, in my case, 300 BARD. And there is an interpreter that has actually loaded. So let's close that. Now, if you want to actually use our basic interpreter loaded onto our new 8-bit system, then we do need to go through a proper serial terminal program. For this, I use PuTTY, which we double click, and we click Serial. We select the COM port, which is COM port 6, and I need to set my BARD rating to 300. So if I now click Open, there we go. We now have a complete basic interpreter that actually works. So again, if I can now type MEM, and return. That's the system memory. You notice how it says one EEPROM byte available. So let's just clear the EEPROM cache out. So we go there we go. Make sure you do it in lowercase. And let's just ask for memory again. And there we go. So we've now got uh, a full 100 and sorry, 1024 bytes of EEPROM storage space available. Uh, there's nothing in the space and we've got 999 bytes of total working RAM. One thing we can do now is actually add basic programs. Um, so let's we can start a new program. So we start with 10 uh, x equals x plus one, 20, and we'll say print, which is a question mark, x, 30, go to 10. And we can list, just to make sure that program is correctly in memory. There it is. And we can run. And you can see it now starts counting. And it will be now in a continuous loop. We hold down control C, we can break the program and we can also then check our memory again. And you can see we've got 
974 bytes of RAM available. So let's clear our memory back out by going new. And because we're in PuTTY on Windows using it as a front end terminal, I've got a little basic program here which I've written in Notepad, which is a simple guess the number game which you'll have seen before. Uh, let's just make sure we've got the lines correct. There we go. So we can select that, go Control C. And now making sure we have got a new program space running. Remember, we type new to clear our memory. I'm now going to right click anywhere in the window space. And you can see it's actually going to put that program in like so, and it's finished. So let's just list to make sure that went in correctly. And it did. So now let's type run. So it's basically guess the number. So what number am I thinking of between 0 and 10? So we just have to input a number. So we'll say 4. No. 7. It was 7. So second guess, I, uh, I won. And the program has now stopped. So if we want to run the program again, play again, we type run. And we can run again. 10, no, 5, no, 7, no, 9, there we are. So what was that 4th, 5th guess, I got that correct? 4th guess, no, 5th guess, I got that right. There we go. So there we have it. It is actually possible to add a real genuine 8-bit computer to your collection for just a few pounds or dollars. If you want to find out more about our tiny basic computers project, which we're building around the Arduino system, you can follow the series so far on our YouTube playlist. Details are on the screen right now. And you can also join our free Facebook group. The address for that is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS tiny basic. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks once again for your company. If you haven't done so, please, please, please do like and subscribe. And also, if you want updates on future Wi-Fi Sheep content on YouTube, do click the notification bell. Well, that's it for me, so I will see you real soon. Bye.